Well, Merry Christmas and praise the Lord for coming to yet another Christmas. Uh, thank you very much for the welcome, my brother, Professor Aaron, and it's good to see you together with your, your clan. I also came with my clan to threaten yours. Uh, this is how serious these matters are. I'm going to remove this uh, so that, uh, you know, preaching is a funny thing. You generate a lot of heat behind those masks and you end up looking very, very strange. I hope I don't even now uh, because once you speak into the mask, it becomes terrible. But such a joy. Thank you so much uh, for welcoming me and thank you, Chaplain, and your team also for welcoming us. Um, I must say I was envying those people who were born in the Christmas week uh, because they share something close to Jesus and uh, they can be given that wonderful privilege of saying, well, Jesus, I was also born during this week, but congratulations and happy birthdays uh, to all of you who were born during this week. Let me begin by introducing my clan. Yeah, my clan. Uh, I think I'll begin with my wife, uh, Canon Dr. Ruth Senyonyi. Uh, she's over there, looking as young as ever, <laughs> and for me, growing as old as I've always done. Uh, but uh, Dr. Ruth Senyonyi is the Provincial Mothers Union pr uh, President for the Church of Uganda. Before I come to the rest of the family, uh, we have a joy because as a family, uh, we tend we usually would come together, COVID kind of interrupted us, but we would come together as a family and share together uh, lunches and spend two days together, but now we can't. Uh, but nevertheless, a number have come, and uh, I want to begin with my brother, Ambassador Henry Maega, and his wife, Dr. Florence Maega. And the children, can I ask you to stand up, Rina, Jackie, Jesse, so that you see them. Uh, so he's the man who represents you in the United Arab Emirates. And he's back for Christmas. He's a dear brother, not only physically, but also in Christ. And so thank you very much for coming for that. I do not know if I have any of the other siblings around before I come to the children. Yes, I have my sister there, uh, Deborah. Is he around? Oh, yes. Okay. And uh, my Muko, uh, I think he's brought his chicken uh, today. Charles Chibuka, uh, we are glad to see you there. I think those are the only ones who are here so far. Oh, senior mother. Sorry, you are in the pillar. That is our senior mom. Uh, uh, senior, please keep standing. As our senior mom, uh, Mrs. Juliana Nyombi, uh, here. Are the children here? The children, please, when, when the parent stands up, oh, they are way down there. Yes, I can see Patricia and Andrew and I don't know who else. But anyway, is it Hannah and uh, Solomon? I don't know. Okay, then I do have, we do have our brother. We call him the governor of the Bank of Uganda because he's a deputy governor there. Deputy director, not governor. You started clapping. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Timothy Sechirai, uh, who works in the Bank of Uganda. Now let me come to the children, our children, the Senyonyi clan. Oh, I beg your pardon. I need to begin with Mukuru Munange. Uh, Mukuru Munange, who has come, Bakuru Nange. They have come as godparents as well, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Christopher Msoke. Where are they seated? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. They are over there. Uh, thank you very much for coming. They've come as godparents uh, to the rest of the children. Now, we do have our daughter. I'll start with her. And the children will stand up at the same time, please. The children, that is Sarah Senyonyi. She's actually a first class graduate of this university. And uh, in her year, in her graduation cohort, she was the best 
She had the highest GPA. So, but I didn't contribute to that. Uh, because some of you may think that I actually influenced the decision. But there she is. Uh, she has come with the four, with the four children, Sinza, Tenda, Mr. Muganzi, and the newest on the team, Chirabo. Uh, then we do have now the parents of the child who has just been baptized, uh, John Paul and Elena and El. And the child who has been baptized is uh, Anaya. You heard the name. They don't live here. They live in uh, Accra, Ghana. They were in Switzerland before, but now they are in Accra, Ghana. So we are glad that we can have them here. And uh, some of you have known that our house was designed by one of our children. I'm trying to now to advertise him. He's an architect. And if you look at our house, you'll want to have one like that. So that is him. Uh, then we do have the newest on the block. Tomorrow they are making six months in marriage. And uh, that is, uh, and not only that, Benjamin actually was born two days after Jesus on the 27th. So Benjamin and Anita, they are graduates of this university again. Uh, so we are glad to have you here making six months. He's a computer scientist and she's uh, yeah, a lawyer uh, from UCU. Matthew couldn't come and Arthur couldn't come because they were not feeling well. Arthur is the husband of Sarah, but they could not come. But otherwise, the clan is here. So how am I doing, Vice Chancellor? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think that's, that now completes my introductions, I believe. So what I'll do is to pray, and uh, then we'll dig into God's word. Let us pray. Dear blessed and everlasting Father, each time we come before you, we come with humility. Knowing that your word can only be understood by the illumination of your Holy Spirit. Today is Christmas Day. And in many ways the familiarity with the story quite often gets into the way. And we forget the miracle of the incarnation. God becoming man. I pray that you will speak to me, reveal your word to me, that you may speak through me. And that you will help me to decrease that only you shall increase. That when we leave this place, we'll have every reason to jubilate as the angels jubilated. May your presence be with us as we look into your word. And may you speak, for it is your voice that we seek to hear. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, um, as you heard me pray, sometimes familiarity can become a hindrance to the message. I'm sure many of you have read the story in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, that was read for us and from which I have taken this message. And you probably know, we sing songs while shepherds watched their flock by night. And so it sounds extremely familiar, but quite often familiarity, as the English say, breeds contempt. But I want to have, I hope, new eyes, not because the words will be new, but because I want to believe that the Holy Spirit has got something to remind us of and maybe even to teach us concerning the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The topic that I have here is Jesus Christ, good news for all people. Now, I need to begin by saying that one of the most discrediting aspects of the gospel 
are the people to whom the first message was entrusted. Very, very strange. And if you look at the people entrusted with the gospel, you start wondering, should I even listen to it? They were not university people. They were not priests. They were not even the most religious in most cases. In fact, I can even go as far as to say some of them were outright irreligious. Who probably attended church or in those days temple occasionally, if at all. Like many people attend Christmas and then they forget about another. I'm not talking about the COVID lockdown that has kept us out of church for long. But even before the COVID lockdown, quite often people would not be coming to church as frequently. So you think of it. That this message was entrusted to people like Zechariah. He was not the high priest. Why wasn't it, wasn't it entrusted to the high priest? The birth of John the Baptist. And then there was this inconsequential virgin girl called Mary. Living in Nazareth. Someone that nobody ever thought about. And yet she became the bearer of the Savior. Her husband, her betrothed, Joseph, was a mere carpenter. I don't know if you have ever thought about it. But actually we don't have the heavy weights of society among those who are interested with the gospel at the beginning. And so when we come to the shepherds, it's interesting that you are talking of people even today. When you talk of shepherds, those are people who spend all their time out in the sun, not necessarily doing the weighty matters of society. <laughs> right? Maybe a little bit of redemption with the magi, but who are they? Gentiles, people probably even foreign to Judaism, to whom had been entrusted the law of the Lord. And they were probably mere astrologers. Now you start saying to yourself, why reveal the message to astrologers? Was God lacking people who are properly educated in religious matters, in matters of the law? Is it any wonder that Jesus later, when he was recruiting his disciples, he had the most unlikely candidates? Tax collector, fishermen, who were so distrust, distrusted that fishermen were not, even, were not even welcome to be witnesses in courts of law. Because they were just not truthful. And then you come to, pe to, to, to the zealot. And many commentators seem to agree that when we talk about this zealot here, he was probably an Osama bin Laden. But to that, Jesus chose to speak the gospel. Isn't that amazing? In other words, we have here a grouping, and you could go on and on, of people who had no public acclaim. You could not introduce them and say, this is the former vice chancellor. <laughs> no. Oh, the vice chancellor, or the deputy vice chancellor, or whoever. They were not. These people had no public acclaim. In society, they would have been the people to be despised. Remember what the Sanhedrin members said of the disciples in the book of Acts? They looked at them and said, these are uneducated people. How do they know so much? So I begin by telling you, my brothers and sisters, that one of the most discrediting aspects of the gospel are the people to whom it was first revealed. Strange. Now I would ask you a question. 
if you were God's public relations manager or director or whatever, <laughs> and you are interested with announcing the birth of Jesus, the Son of God, he who had lived in eternity and had never known what it is to be separated from his father, he who had created everything in the world was now visiting the world. And then they give you the responsibility to become the public relations officer. Now for those of you who are from, uh, who have studied mass com or media studies or communications or whatever, listen, I have a suspicion none of you would be employed. Jesus would not retain you. God would not retain you to announce it. Strange. I consider a couple of things that I would think that if I was God's PR, I would want impact. That when I announce it, it's impactful. Isn't it? You want everyone to say, wow. You want everyone to say, I want to hear more. That's what I would expect. That I'm publishing the good news of the Son of God, the creator of the world, Not one that is born in a ship pen. You probably would have expected that he would be born in the palace of Herod or maybe in Caesar, uh, Caesar's uh, palace. I want impact. Impact. That's where I would go. I would go to State House. And Museveni would call for <laughs> the media, right? That's what I would do. Call for the media. And they are all there. And I make an announcement. The only letdown is, unfortunately, this baby was not born in Mlago Hospital. He was born pretty much like I was born myself. Because, you see, I'm not a hospital child. So, I'm at peace with Jesus. <laughs> I was born by a banana tree. Because that traditionally was the way people were born. Don't think that I was born in the 19th century. I was actually born in the 20th century. But I'm not a hospital child. I would also expect that if I'm a PR for God, I would look for the media outlets that communicate to the largest number of people, isn't it? So for newspapers, I would probably choose the new vision and monitor. Not read paper. Would I? That's not what I would choose. I would flood the social media with the news of the birth of the Son of God. I would make sure that the best televisions, even worldwide, CNN, BBC or whatever, they are all in the know of this. this. You know, let me not go too far. All I'm saying is, somehow the PR business here looked very, very low-key. But you know, I have a suspicion that if God had chosen to make known the birth of Jesus Christ, using the priests, the scribes, the rabbis, the Pharisees, and that kind of group, you know what they would have done? I suspect, this is, a, this is speculation, but speculation isn't bad, because it happens even today. They would probably go and call a conference to discuss this matter. If you, they would start theologizing. Now, where do I get that kind of mad idea? The point is, in Matthew chapter 2, when Herod calls the priests, the religious leaders, and he says to them, tell me, where is the Christ to be born? There is a kind of... It doesn't matter. They simply quote the scriptures... They knew exactly what the scriptures had said. They knew how to theologize about it. And that is exactly what would have happened with this news if it had been revealed 
to the likes of me. You know that? That's what would have happened. So I want to think that God is extremely, extremely knowledgeable. He's certainly omniscient and all that. And so he understood that the best way for the gospel to go forward is to give it to the people that need it. Now I ask you the question today. Do you need the gospel? Do you need the gospel? Now, for some of us, because we already saved, we are so familiar with it that when I ask, when I say, do you need the gospel, we'll say quickly, yes. But the question is, how much attention do we ever give to the gospel? Would we act like the shepherds as we are going to see? Or would we sit down and simply say, I'm spending time in prayer, I'm spending time reading the Bible, but not publishing the gospel. Not publishing the gospel. You see, friends, God knew what he was doing. He chose the right people. Hence, the church owes everything to these people of no public acclaim. The birth of Jesus, he was revealed in his humiliation. It was announced to the shepherds. It does appear like when you look at it chronologically, the shepherds were probably the first outsiders that is outside the area where Jesus was born who, to whom God first announced it. The Magi come later. The Magi come later. That's the reason why when Herod is killing, he kills all two years and under. Because time had actually passed. Sometimes when we talk about it, it sounds like actually the Magi came almost on the, you know, following the shepherds. No. But where we are, Jesus enters the world in his humiliation. He chose shepherds in the fields at night. Now let's try to understand these shepherds a little bit. Like I've already said, these were not important people in society. The shepherds did not have a good reputation, pretty much like the fishermen. And probably if you want to understand a little bit of that, you would have to look for yourself at Genesis 30, where it talks about Jacob dealing with Laban's animals. And in the end, who had more animals? The shepherd or the owner of the animals. It was the shepherd, Jacob. So even at this time when Jesus, his birth is announced to the shepherds, shepherds had a bad reputation. They spent days and nights out in the field. They did not have time to fulfill the religious rituals of Judaism. So if you are talking about going to church, the shepherds were not the kind of people that you would find in church every Sunday or Sabbath. Because they were in the bush feeding. And their work was a 24-hour task. Because not only did they feed the sheep during the day, they also protected the sheep in the night. So the time for going to temple was just not there. These are the kind of people that we are talking about. Later, many rabbis actually thought them to be dishonest and to be two-faced. And their testimony, like I said, could not be admissible in courts of law. Because they did not observe Jewish religious rituals. And of course, the second problem is they often confused mine and thine. <laughs> is this sheep mine or is it thine? For those of you who don't know, old English, thine is yours. 
because now we have to be very careful of the generation we speak to. They often confuse that. So when they looked at the sheep, they were more concerned about increasing their own ownership. But humanly speaking, if God was to reveal himself, we would have expected him to come here. Thornycroft Chapel. Do you know what happened last night, congregation? The Savior was born. Isn't that what we would expect? You come and announce it here. But that's not where he did. Because the gospel belongs to all people, whether in church or outside the church. God chose the simplest of men to witness the birth of Jesus. It's not just for the religious. In fact, if anything, it's much more for the irreligious. So that all people would hear. Is it any wonder that when the angel appeared in verse 9, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. What was their response? How did they feel about it? The Bible tells us they were filled with fear. If the religious can fear, what would the religious feel? I don't expect this kind of thing. Why should I see what I'm seeing? It was not their everyday experience. Their everyday experience was to look at sheep <laughs> and to look for where grass is. Their everyday experience was not even to pray. These were people who spent their time out in the bush and so when this light comes, when the glory of the Lord appears to them, when an angel appears to them, the only thing that can happen, they're gripped with the fear. You know, this teaches us that God uses whomsoever he wills, including the simplest. Including the simplest. It's not us, the evangelist. I'm an evangelist. God called me to that. But it's not just the evangelists who preach everywhere. God uses. And you know what? He wants to use you. In your simplest form. Even when you think that you are inconsequential, uninfluential, God wants to use you. He uses whoever he chooses to use. It's interesting the description the angel gives to the shepherds. The way that they would be able to identify where the child is. The Bible tells us when the angel is speaking, starting from verse 10, he says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. But listen, that is the climax. Good news that will be for all people. That is the climax. Then he goes on to the anticlimax. And the angel in verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And where is he? This will be the sign. Ah, what sign would you expect? <laughs> what sign would you expect? That you will go somewhere there, you will see white horses, you will see, you know, a retinue of soldiers who are marching and going to see the king. That is the anticlimax. Because if he's savior of the world for all people, if it is good news for all people, irrespective of where they are, whether they are black or they are white or they are white, everything, the poor and the rich, the literate and the illiterate, all the people, the men and the women, every tribe, every nation, every language, if the gospel is for them, friends, this is an anticlimax. Listen to what it says as a sign how you will be able to identify him and he says to them you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes 
and lying in a manger. Not in Mlago Hospital 6, Ward 6 something. I can't remember which one. I know we had a child there. But I can't remember whether it's Ward 6E or 6 what. No, no, no. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying that you're going to find a child. The sign for you will be glory. You've just seen this glory. When you go there, you will see more glory. No. It's an anticlimax. Now he says to them, he will be wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying not in a seven by six bed. <laughs> no, no, no. Not even in a, what, what do they call my, I always forget these baby things, but uh, since now I have children, they remember these, these, these little echibaya. Eh? What is it called? A crib. Uh -uh. Or a coat. No. Lying in a manger. Now it was commonplace among the Jews that when a baby was born, the baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes. So that's, that's not most unusual. The only thing we can say about it is that it is very ordinary, too ordinary for a born son of God. Too ordinary. That even the king is being wrapped in swaddling clothes. You know what many of the notables in Uganda do when they are having babies? They fly out. They fly out. <laughs> Not for Jesus. There was no flight to anywhere to be born. In fact, this morning we were reading the text of Joseph walking from Nazareth, which is in the north, in Galilee, and going down to the south in Bethlehem. It's even farther than walking from here to Seta or Kampala. But that's what happened with them. As far as he was concerned, that was his abroad. Right? So there is an anticlimax here. When the story is told, sometimes we miss the amazing details of what happened on that day. Because the angel says to the shepherds, you are going to find this baby in swaddling clothes. In other words, extremely ordinary, but worse. You are going to find him, he who is the son of God, he who is the good news for all people. You are going to find him in a manger. In a manger. Or do you want to call it a feeding trough for animals? That's where you're going to find him. Why? It's an anticlimax as far as I'm concerned that Jesus, when he was incarnated, he was wrapped up like an ordinary child. He had nothing to distinguish him. To say that this child is divine. This is the Jesus as it happened. Not as we have added on our own embellishments. This is the Jesus. That at the time that he was born, he was so ordinary that business was going on all around him. And nobody was asking, who is that baby that has been born in that place? He was humiliated in a manger. That's not where human beings live. When we lived in the U.S., I remember one of the phrases I picked from there, which was very interesting. They would talk of people without addresses as people of no fixed abode. That's how Jesus actually came. He came as a baby without an address. So the angel could not say, you will find him on a street cold. You will find him in a hospital cold. You will find him in a room cold. But it must have been like John Senyonyi, I don't even know what the banana tree is where I was born. 
But this is the God that we worship, isn't it? He's amazing. He comes in the simplest way. And so on this Christmas day, can we remember that Jesus did not come somehow as some exalted king, but he came in the simplest way. And of course, if he had been born in a hotel, possibly it would not be accessible to the shepherds. Restricted access. You are smelling like sheep. We can't let you in. But this Jesus, do you see why God, I was just thinking about the wisdom that God had. Do you see that God makes sure that Jesus is born where there is no restricted access? In other words, no person can say, I cannot get to Jesus. None. In other words, we must never on our own ever put any kind of roadblocks to Jesus. Absolutely none. And so the shepherds just walked in and after all the way they were was very simply the way that the place they were in looked like. It was a place for animals. And there were people used to animals. And the Bible tells us then they told of what had happened. I will skip a little bit the part of the angels and I will come back to it shortly. But let me just say a couple of things very quickly. They told the news. So for them immediately they heard, and I hope it will be even today for us this Christmas, that immediately after the angels had left, what did he say? What did they say? Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. Unbelievable. It's understandable. Listen to verse 18. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. They all marveled. They did not know what exactly is this that these shepherds are talking about. First of all, it was the wrong media outlet. (laughs) Wrong. (laughs) And so when they heard, the only thing they could do was to wonder. They did not, it does not say they believed or they disbelieved. No, none of the two, they just wondered. And you know what? Among those who wondered, I don't know who was there, but we do not hear of them any any time later. We don't hear of them. Did they forget? See, the one thing that I've learned about the gospel is that when we do nothing about the gospel, if you are not saved and you do nothing about the gospel, you will soon push this news to the sidelines. This happened to me before I came to Christ. 1975 or thereabouts, a dear brother that many of you now know, he was a university student with me, Stephen Langer, and he was already saved. He had been saved even when he was in high school in Budo. We knew him, called two of us, sat us, in his room at the University of Nairobi, told us about Christ, and I say I was so convicted, and I remember that, I was so convicted that I said, I am going to think about that. (laughs) Wrong decision. I will think about it. Procrastination doesn't work with the gospel. You know what? Until the time when another person came and told me about Jesus months later in June, on June the 18th to be precise, 1976, I had not been thinking about what Steve Langer had said. When you do nothing about the gospel, chances are you're not going to think about it. And so, for many of us, what we do is every time we hear the gospel, we push it ahead. You hear the gospel, you push it ahead. And you keep on pushing it ahead, but in the interim, you don't think about it. 
But the gospel is urgent. What do the shepherds do? The shepherds, the moment they heard the gospel, they went with haste. They wasted no time and they went to see this child that had been told of them. Told them. Isn't that what it should be, my brothers and sisters? That when you hear the gospel, it's not a time for you to start debating it. It's not a time for you to procrastinate about it. It's not a time for you to think, I will think about it later. It's not a time for you to say, next Sunday I will be in church. Even tomorrow I will be in church. Listen, the time for salvation is now. That's what it is. The gospel we preach is not a gospel for tomorrow. It's a gospel for now. That's what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2. Now is the day of salvation. He could have said today, but he doesn't say today is the day of salvation. He says now. So that even the seconds, even the minutes, whatever it is, are all accounted for. So see what happened with these people? They heard. They wondered. And then, Nothing more. And it happened to many people. When the Magi themselves came into Jerusalem and Herod called the religious leaders, they heard, they answered Herod's question and they did nothing. That's one of the worst things, the best killers of the gospel. That many people spend all their time procrastinating about it. You hear it today? And you think you have tomorrow. And we do not even think what Luke later reports for us in chapter 12. Of the man who had a bumper harvest. And this man who had a bumper harvest, he said, let me build more and more barns. In other words, he was planning for the future. Isn't planning good? Very interesting. That night... God came to him and gave him another name. He did not call him John Senyonyo or any of your names. He called him Fool. Renamed in public interest, as Idi Amin would have said. Your soul is required of you today. That's what he said to him. And that was the end of it. Yes, it was news from the most unlikely media outlet. You would even think it probably came through a tabloid. How can a tabloid all of a sudden announce our CEO has come to Christ and they put it on the front page? I don't think they would, would they? <laughs> if they want to continue as a tabloid, it won't happen. But that's what happened with these Maybe the news lost credibility in their estimate of the shepherds. Now let me go to the last one and then I'll shut up. And the last one that I want to look at is the angels. Now listen, the very first thing that I want to say to you, there was no fanfare on earth. There was no shaking of leaves or what, no. No. There was nothing of the sort. On earth, it was as usual. Business as usual. That's what it was. Now, by the way, you need to understand that in the Jewish households, when a baby boy was born, the musicians in the locality, in this case, it would have been in Bethlehem. I don't want you to think of Bethlehem as a very large city, not even as big as Mukono. No, no, no. It was a much smaller area than it is today, right now, in Bethlehem. But it was a small town, and the normal thing that they would do when, the, when a baby boy was born, the musicians would immediately congregate in the household, and they would sing music to celebrate the birth of a child. That was the tradition. Do you hear that in the case of Jesus? It's amazing the way God worked things out. You don't hear of any musicians coming. 
No local musicians on the first Christmas. But hey, heaven provided the music. Heaven provided the music. Listen to what the angels, let me begin from verse 13 there. And suddenly, after the other angel had spoken, there was with the angel a multitude. Nobody is talking about numbers here. It's talking about heaven being mobilized to celebrate. The good news was not theirs. The good news was for us. Is that it? The good news was for us. But now all of a sudden heaven is mobilized and we hear that a multitude, a multitude of angels. Every time I hear about these multitudes, I think to myself, maybe when I get to heaven, I'll try to count. But probably it's a useless task. A multitude, the Bible says, of the heavenly host, Praising God and listen to what they say. They said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. That is the only place that celebrated the birth of Jesus. While on earth people were busy going about their business. I don't know if the census was over. We are not told. People were busy sleeping in their beds. People were busy eating their Christmas meals. People were busy doing everything else. But then there came those angels and the shepherds were given the amazing revelation of the angels as they, they floated. That's what we hear. I don't know. And I don't care. The point is, heaven celebrated that there was good news for you and for me. You know, the only, time, the only other time in the New Testament or in the Gospels that we hear about heaven celebrating? It is in the Gospel of Luke, again, chapter 15. Talking about the widow who had ten coins, lost one, found it. When she found it, she rejoiced. Talking about the shepherd who had a hundred sheep, one got lost, he went looking for it, brought it back, and it talks about the angels celebrating the repentance of one. And that is you. They celebrated on that Christmas day. The angels announced and then they gathered a multitude of the heavenly hosts because they were remembering that this is the God that created them too. Because they knew that this is the one who sits in the bosom of the Father. Because they knew that this Jesus is the one that sits on the right hand of God. Because they knew that this Jesus is indeed the Son of God. But there was more why they celebrated. They celebrated because you and I were receiving good news. Heaven celebrates when you receive good news. Heaven celebrates when all is well with you. That's why, as, as I said in Luke chapter 15... Heaven celebrates when we repent, when we come to Jesus. And that's what happened, my dear brothers and sisters. On June the 18th, 1976, I did not know. Indeed, nothing even showed up. But when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, there was celebration in heaven. The question is, who will give heaven another celebration? No fanfare on earth. No fanfare on earth. But there was celebration in heaven. And that's what God wants to do with us. My brothers and sisters, he says on earth, peace among those with whom he's pleased. Peace. Peace with God. Peace with God. Because like we were saying 
baptizing those children. All of us, are bo- bo- we are born into sin. We have no peace with God. But listen, on Christmas Day, we can announce peace with God. But also peace between each other. Peace between nations. That Mr. Biden, and I can't remember, what is the Prime Minister of England? I can't remember him, or whatever his name. Uh, and all these other people, the United Nations and what not, who are trying to find peace. Christmas was announcing peace with one another. But not only that, Christmas announces peace within within your heart. That same peace that I experienced the day I gave my life to Jesus. And all of a sudden I felt like a burden had been lifted off my heart. And up to now, I think, I don't remember ever feeling burdened before I came to Christ. But when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I felt light, like something had rolled off. Peace within. Do you want that? I don't need to say more. Do you have peace with God? Do you have peace with others? Do you have peace within? And if you don't, that is the purpose of Christmas. Let us pray. I'm going to ask my brothers and sisters that we take some time to reflect on what we've heard. And maybe you are at that position where you say, I really need to take this step. I need to give my life to Jesus. And all I'm asking you to do is to take that step Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. It may even be that you gave your life to Jesus, but you have been walking away. And you do not know that peace that he gives within. I'm going to ask that if you're one of those and you're willing to give your life to Jesus, You only need to say to him, I want you in my heart. And I'm going to pray. And I'll ask you to repeat this prayer after me. If you are in that category, as you invite Christ into your heart. Pray these words after me. Dear Father, thank you for speaking to me. I know that Jesus was born for me. And I do not have to appear special or to put on a sense of being special. For I too was born in sin. Forgive me my sin. I invite Jesus Christ into my heart. To save me. I confess that I am your child today. Thank you for saving me. And I will confess you as my Lord and my Savior. From now and evermore. In Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed and ever-living God, we want to thank you so much for the word that you have spoken. 
and whatever was not of you, please expunge. But our plea and our cry <clears throat> is that your word that has gone out, as Isaiah says, will not return to you empty. And maybe there are people here that have said yes to you today. And all we ask, give them the boldness and the courage like the shepherds to move with haste and make public that which you have revealed to them and which you've done for them. We thank you and praise you for this time and as we go away that we'll not forget what you say to us in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now my dear friends you have heard and maybe some of you have prayed that prayer and you say today I have indeed decided to give my life to Jesus. The greatest joy, like I said, in heaven is when a sinner repents. And so what you have done, you've given heaven a celebration. We may not see it with our eyes, but we don't have to. But the Bible also says that to be saved, you need to believe in your heart, which we can't see, but also to confess with your lips which is audible to us or at least visible to us. And so if you have prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you now to make public the decision you have made. If there is someone, just put up your hand and you say, yes, today I've given my life to Jesus. Is there someone, please? Just put up your hand and let's do this quickly. You know that today you have said yes to Jesus. You say yes. Is there someone? I hope all of you are believers. Because you know what? I'm on my way to heaven. Myself. I'm on my way to heaven's land. I'm on my way to... How many of you know that song? Way to heaven. I'm on my way, praise the Lord, I'm on my way. If you won't go, don't hinder me. If you won't go, don't hinder me. If you won't go, don't hinder me. I'm on my way, praise the Lord, I'm on my way. I'm not the chaplain, I don't want to be chased out of here. <laughs> 